today on call out. Nelson Sarr gets a taste of reality when their swift water training course becomes an actual mission. Let's just get the experienced guys down here. Yeah, I'll be done. And later, making the grade on the swift water team. <laughs> He's underneath! Sunday, 8 a.m. Members of Nelson's search and rescue are gathering for the last day of an intensive three-day Swiftwater rescue course when instructor Chris Armstrong receives a call. Okay, hold up. South Columbia search and rescue need a Swiftwater team and are requesting immediate assistance. Okay, we'll, we'll take care of it. I'll call him right now and get this going. Instinctively, the team moves quickly to reload the rafts and equipment for travel. I've got like 14 people, so we'll just make it an exercise. We'll go down there. For this group of students, what began as a mock exercise to wrap up their Swiftwater course has just become an actual search and rescue mission. They're experienced SAR volunteers, but Swiftwater Rescue is new to most of them. Uh, Beaver Valley's been on a search here. An older local man from a neighboring community has been missing for over a day and a half. He was last seen socializing with friends by a small creek near his home. In this case, there is little chance that the missing man is alive. When we get called out to these type of rescues, unless someone's out on a rock and calling for help, 70 plus percent of the time, it's gonna be a recovery. The team travels 60 kilometers south towards the town of Fruitvale. At the creek, they are met by South Columbia and Castlegar Search and Rescue. Okay. You see those chairs? Right. That's where he was. Meters up. That's where he was. These ground SAR teams have already searched the banks of the creek, but not the actual waters. That's a job for the swift water specialists. When we enter these areas, we wear thermal protection because we're working in very cold water. We have a lot of skills and equipment that allow us to enter these environments, search it safely, and make sure no one is going to get hurt. Chris, this water is built is, is steady to here. Mm -hmm. So we've got big water here, bigger water here, and bigger water here. Downstream from where they stand, the creek connects with two other streams, which significantly increases its volume and strength. Is, is there any natural catchment to a log jam, a there strainer, is, anything? There's a real big strainer down here. Okay. They don't think anything will get past there. So that's probably where I'm going to go first. The strainer in this case is a log jam where fallen trees have created a sieve-like barrier. Any body or object floating down the creek will likely be trapped by this log jam. That will be our, our bottom perimeter. I need to go and make sure that, that, that a body can't get through there. I'll take a team of four down there. They form three teams made up of members with different skill sets and experience levels to maximize efficiency. Chris Armstrong will lead Team Charlie downstream to the log jam. If nothing is found there, the team will make their way upstream. Team Papa will start in the area around the point last seen. Team Romeo will search the midpoint. Everybody understand what's going on? Are we taking any risks for a dead person? No. None at all. Anyone who enters the water, even if it is this deep, is tethered. Why? Chris takes a moment to remind everyone of the importance of personal safety. You can walk across a river that's, you know, knee deep. That's fine, you have control. But the moment you fall down and all that surface area hits the full size of your body, you're no longer in control. The river's gonna take you where it wants. Pat, take us where we're taking. The two teams tasked with searching downstream walk along a private road, which runs parallel to the creek. Team Romeo, led by Callie Chatton, heads for the midpoint on the creek between point last seen and the log jam. They mark their entry point into the thick bush with flagging tape. This will help the other teams to join them at the river if they locate the subject. Everything they've learned about swift water behavior is being put to good use. It's a much more likely entrapment point. Even though that looks like a hole that might stick, that's, that's much more likely because of the undercut.
We look to understand what's happening beneath the surface of the water. There's a big difference between perceived hazards and actual hazards in the water. What looks nice and calm can actually pose the greatest threat. Well, we're doing a little bit of a shoreline search here, yeah. looking for possible entrapment points. And, uh, Less than half an hour into the search, and Team Charlie has found the missing subject. Lulu, this is uh, Team Romeo. I'll get my team together and we'll respond with it. We're trying to find access to the river to find this log jam to make sure that it was a complete, you know, catchment of the current. On the second spot we looked, not even 40 feet from the river's edge, we found him. He hadn't even made it to the log jam. Doug, we got a code forward. We're all going down to the end. As Team Romeo and Team Papa move towards a rendezvous point, Chris Armstrong radios SAR Command with a special request. We're going to need a stretcher, a wheel, a bag, and the wrap kit. And for our team, um, let's just get the experienced guys down here. Yeah, I'll be done. Um, dealing with bodies is an unpleasant thing. It's not for everybody. But those who have done it and are okay with it to this point, it's best to keep them from doing it. We have enough people that are kind of already poisoned by that kind of event. For Chris Clark, a rookie SAR member, this is his first exposure to a deceased subject. I've never been in that situation before. I've never, you know, I've never handled a lifeless body. So I was definitely a little shocked, but the water's pretty unforgiving. So the, the expectation in the swift water world is that, you know, most of the time your subject isn't, isn't going to be, isn't going to be alive anymore. So give me on tether upstream here and I'll uh, just go there and secure them. Pop him off and he's going to pendle him over and then Chris and I will just pull him up on shore. You good with that? Sure. He was with me when we found it. We talked about it. He wanted to continue. This is a, a good opportunity in a safe environment with people that he trusts to go through this process. Recovering a body that has been battered by the water for 38 hours is not a pleasant job, but it has to be done. Like say Sheila, go out to where the trail started, stay there, and then Chris go out, meet up the other team and bring him in. The crew must now flag the path to the main road. There, the other teams are on standby, awaiting further instructions. I've sent the other three members out to help bring the equipment in and what have you. Whenever you're dealing with a body, especially with your members, you gotta keep them busy. We don't want them to stand here over top of a, a deceased, thinking about it, reflecting on how they feel, doing those system checks in their head, thinking, oh, am I okay with this, am I okay with this? As requested by the coroner, Chris Armstrong documents the scene before moving the body. It basically shows that there's, you know, that they have documentation that there isn't foul play, that it's natural, it's a natural catchment. They have all that information to make any decisions they have to do. It wasn't until we had actually pulled them onto the bank and turned them over that there was a little more gravity to, to the fact that this person had, had passed on. Um, yeah, still just kept focused and followed direction and was there to help. The single-wheeled stretcher arrives as Charlie team finishes packaging the body. Meanwhile, Team Papa clears a trail to the road to make extraction easier. Nothing can ever fully prepare someone for the first exposure to the grim reality of death. But training helps. Good job, guys. On this last day of a three-day swift water training course, 
these river rookies passed a difficult and unexpected test in the field. I don't know exactly how to feel at this moment. I just know that it's a part of life and that uh, happens to us all, you know. No, it wasn't. So, I'm just, I'm just happy that we found them and we got them out of there, for sure. Some members on this course definitely got more than they were bargaining for. But at the end of the day, they're with Search and Rescue. This is the work that we do. They're going to leave this with knowledge. They'll be stronger for it. Now, making the grade as a swift water and flood technician. All those who hit it had their head up, down, and the other ones turned way too late. I need you to do a body roll. Friday, 12 noon on the banks of the Slocan River in southeastern British Columbia. Instructor Chris Armstrong is training a group of SAR members in swift water rescue. Go, About half the students are river rookies. The rest, seasoned veterans, are taking the three-day refresher to stay certified. Everyone is here to learn how to rescue themselves and others. Now, what are my hazards? Two exposed rocks. One of them is a bit of an eddy behind it. The other one is a hole. An eddy is typically a calm spot where the water is almost still and moving gently. A hole, on the other hand, is formed when water pours over top of a rock. Behind large rocks, holes can be deep enough to trap a person or boat underwater. Though large holes can be dangerous, smaller ones can offer a refuge for someone being swept uncontrollably downriver. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to catch this hole in the river. To do it, we're gonna set ourselves upstream, come down defensive, lining ourselves up in the current so that we're gonna pass on the river left side of that hole. Just before we get to the rock, we're gonna turn offensively and swim, trying to catch the hole right behind the rock. That's where the water's collecting and being pulled in, it's the strongest. If we can catch it up there, it's much easier than further down. Students start out making the typical mistake of traveling with their bottoms down and heads up. They learn quickly that swimming defensively involves lying flat with your bottom up and head back to avoid submerged objects. All those who hit it had their head up, down, when they went to look where they're going to swim, and the other ones turned way too late. Students that turn too late are swept downriver. After a rather bumpy start, they get better at switching from defensive to offensive swimming and finding the sanctuary of the hole. In the next exercise, students learn how to maneuver out of the powerful current and into a large eddy. Proper swift water technique involves split-second timing because you're moving so quickly downriver. At just the right moment, the students need to Go roll down. their bodies out of the current and over top of the eddy line, a well-defined series of small whirlpools that forms where an eddy meets the downstream moving current. It's always tough to get over that eddy line. Even that one, it doesn't seem that strong, but when your legs are getting pulled down the river, you gotta roll, get over that fence, get into that calm water and swim in. If you don't roll, it'll just drag you down the river. It takes technique. Doesn't matter how strong you are. It's your biggest muscle. All together hard. <laughs> Why are you breathing? This next piece of training is desensitization. Finding a nice big hole where we can swim it, do rescues out of it, put boats in it, flip, get tossed, get desensitized. Good, safe place to feel the force of the river, not be in that much danger. So when we have to go someplace like this and perform a rescue, we've been there, we've done it, we know what it feels like, and we're okay with it. Come on, fight, 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 fight! There we go. A trainee disappears under the raft. The students become concerned. Chris is not. So 
it's real good, guys. Everybody's swimming really well. We're on the first afternoon. We're just about finishing up, and everybody's already at the level we need, which is great, which means we'll step it up even more. You'll get more out of the course. It's awesome. Day two, 10 a.m. So yesterday we got a fair bit done. So now we're, we're pretty much ahead of the game. So I'm gonna try to get these guys doing a lot of rescue scenarios. We've got an injured person. We need to get across a creek or a small area, or maybe we have to go out as a group, pluck somebody off a rock and bring them back. This is how we're gonna do it. The day begins with one of the most basic forms of rescue, a wade rescue. Now what's the flotation gonna do to me out there? It's gonna pick me up, right? So what can Ola do to help me out? He can grab my lapels and he can weight me. So as I'm going out there, he can stand in my eddy where it's easy to stand. He can push down on me. Two of us can definitely get further than one. Get in behind Doug. Remember, you're, you're pushing him forward and down and you're keeping in line so everybody's working in that eddy that Doug's creating. See if you can hold it together. Push, push, push it forward, push it forward. As the water gets deeper, the team becomes more buoyant and they are swept off their feet. A wade rescue works best when the water level is below the PFD, or personal flotation device. Start talking to them. In higher waters, a throw line is often used to pluck people from the water. To make sure you only offer them the rope by putting the bag well over their head. Rope. The subject grabs it and is then pulled to safety in a pendulum motion. Oh, uh, that wasn't too bad, you know. The more, more attempts you make, the, the easier it gets. The more confident you feel. If the subject is unconscious, injured, hypothermic, or otherwise unable to grab onto the rope, the rescuer will swim out to the subject while being tethered to other team members. This method is called live bait swim. The students practice the live bait rescue until they get it right. Get down, get down, get down! Good job, well done. It's exactly what we're looking for. Good rope management, got him in nice and clean, waited for the signal. We're gonna stop down in the crazy spot and we'll go for a swim down there. British Columbia's fast-moving rivers tend to undercut their banks, causing trees to fall, creating dangerous log jams. Getting washed under a knot of trees can mean death by drowning, unless you know how to save yourself. Chris has set up various unnerving scenarios in which the students have to rescue themselves. This is pretending to be the leading edge of a log, a sweeper, a strainer, or maybe even a log jam. What happens if we go under it? Assistant Swiftwater Course instructor Patrick McIver demonstrates how to get out of the entrapment. You gotta get calm, head back, get a knee up, a knee up, fins go down, stand up, walk off. That was textbook. Let's go do it, one after the other. Nice and calm. Try again, catch your breath. Good, good job. Soon as you put a knee up, both your hands go down. You gotta stabilize with your arms. Other students follow. None as graceful as Pat, but eventually their perseverance pays off. Further downriver, Chris simulates another all-too-common hazard, a foot entrapment. This could be a submerged branch that needs to be broken, or clothing that must be cut away or ripped clear of the entrapment. Remaining calm and focused while fighting the full force of the current requires serious commitment. Panic will ultimately lead to drowning. You had it twice. Remember, get your free hand to the string and hold it, and then bring the scissors to it. Good job. 
job. The final exercise is not mandatory, but no one sits it out. We come in trapped on our, our PFD. It's an exercise to mentally imprint how to get out of that PFD. We're actually going to put them on a tether, shove them to the bottom. They're going to become entrapped. They have to find their buckles, get it undone, and get out. Come on, fight, 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 fight. There he goes. There he is. It's real good, guys. So let's grab up our gear. Let's go get the boats to the trailer. Let's go get warm and have a beer. After two physically and mentally demanding days, this group of dedicated volunteers is one step closer to becoming certified flood and swift water technicians. Call-out search and rescue features real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.